as the should said, I am interested in microbial diversity and function in the environment. And I started at Waterloo in January of this year. And so the two stories that I'm going to talk about today both stem from my work with Jill Banfield at UC Berkeley as part of my postdoc. And then at the end, if there's time, uh, I'll take a little bit of time for some shameless self-promotion about the new uh, research that I've got going on in my lab. So I'm going to look at two different stories, and both of these are tied together uh, by the bioinformatic and, and sequencing advances in recent years that have allowed us to look at microbial communities from environments in much greater detail. And so the technique that I have been using, um, and that is going to sort of underpin both of these stories today, is genome-resolved metagenomics. And when I'm talking about genome-resolved metagenomics, what I mean is, you start with a microbial community. This is a nice colorized image of a microbial biofilm growing on your tongue. Uh, it's after lunch, so this is a more reasonable thing. Um, that can be sediment, which are the samples that I'm going to be talking about, which are substantially less photogenic. Really, that can be any microbial community. You take the total microbial community, extract all of the DNA. I'm not sure if that's a particularly useful way to there we go. Um, and then sequence it. Uh, and this gives you a baseline understanding of your community. Lots of work can be done with those short sequences. But to take this a step further, you can assemble those sequences into longer scaffolds that connect genes and functions together. Um, and then one further step is binning, where you take the scaffolds and identify within them which stemmed from the same original organism and reconstruct draft genomes, and in some cases, close to complete genomes from these samples. So when we're talking about genome-resolved metagenomics, it's this added step of binning, where we identify the specific contributions uh, of a single organism or population to that data set. So the binning process, where we take scaffolds and identify uh, which pieces came from which genomes and cluster them together can make use of a number of different pieces of information. That can be based on the coverage in one sample or the coverage across a time series or depth series, some connected set of samples, multiple samples from an environment now being much more common in metagenomics than they were even say a couple of years ago. We can look at the nucleotide composition or the phylogenetic affiliation of the genes on those scaffolds to start to identify which ones belong to the same population. And with some curation, you can end up with close and complete or good quality draft, similar to what you'd see with sequencing an isolate. And at the end of the day, what my question is from these data sets is, what are these organisms contributing to their environments? What is their role within that microbial community? What interactions do we see between these members? Are there organisms with relatively reduced metabolism? What organisms are active in the nitrogen or sulfur cycles? What are their roles in biogeochemistry uh, within the environment? And also, specifically now for my research program, what of those functions can we leverage to uh, change the environment, to remediate contaminants, or to drive specific processes in the direction that we want? And so, metagenomics, just a little bit of history. So when you're looking at the genome-resolved metagenomics, the simpler your community, the more reduced those are the number of organisms the easier it is to develop um, bins. Uh, and so you can get you know, most of your organisms defined as genomes as you go up in community complexity from something very restrictive to something maybe perhaps still a little bit low diversity in the trophic ocean compared to soil, which is one of the most complex microbial environments on Earth. You gain, uh, <clears throat> as you are similar, you gain traction. And those of you who are familiar with metagenomics can see from these Examples, these are relatively old examples from metagenomics, like SOC, acid mine drainage. I would argue the landscape currently looks much more like this. If you have a simple microbial community with the power of sequencing, the ability to sequence multiple samples across, across different time points, we're really in a situation where most of those organisms are tractable for binning. And now, even in soil, even in these most complex of systems, we're able to generate genome sequences and draft genomes for at least some of those populations the most abundant, the most discreet. And what that has meant is that when we go into new environments, we're now able, no matter how complex they are, to start generating draft genomes for organisms that we've never seen in culture before. They've resisted cultivation, or they've been you know, underneath our radar. We haven't even been trying to culture them. And <clears throat> this sort of came to a head with the description of 750 genomes, more than close to 800 from groundwater systems, so sub subterranean systems, all from lineages 
but had no cultivated representatives. And this work got a little bit of media attention. So what I love about this quote uh, from uh, Scientific American was this idea that as you develop a new way of looking, as you increase your ability uh, to look at an environment, that maybe it's not surprising when discoveries do occur, they sometimes come in torrents. Find a different way of looking, and novel forms of life appear everywhere. And I really think that that's where we're at with metagenomics right now, and with, with environmental sequencing and single cell sequencing. That we now have the ability to go into any environment that we choose, no matter how complex, and start to develop an understanding of those microorganisms, not just from a who is there perspective, but from uh, what are they doing? How do they interact? What are their functions in these environments? What is their importance in these environments? And that's just a really exciting space to be working in. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with the first story. We're looking at candidate phyla. Candidate phyla are uh, lineages on the tree of life that we don't have a cultivated representative for. And looking at biogeochemical cycles in the subsurface. And the site that I was working at is the rifle site. It's in Colorado. This is a picture of the site in its heyday as a uranium refinery site. You can see the Colorado River running along the back. And in behind these buildings are the tailings ponds that are the direct uh, cause of the heavy metal contamination at the site. This is an overview of the site today. Most of that infrastructure is gone. And so again, we have the Colorado River here. This is where the buildings were. This is where the tailings ponds were. And what this is highlighting with the green stars are the locations where we, with the Banfield lab, had metagenomic sampling. Um, so this was a huge data set, because for each of these sites, uh, occasionally these were pumped groundwater. In a lot of cases, they were sediment cores. And so this CSP1 site was a sediment core taken in July of 2011. And we actually had 14 different samples that each were given a lane of Illumina high seq sequencing. So this is about a terabase of sequencing. It's a huge amount of data. And so we took sampling at three, four, five, and six meter depths. And I'm going to talk about this one box. I'm going to talk about one of these metagenomes. Um, and this is the five meter depth, sample number four. Each of these boxes represents a discrete chunk of sediment. And so you can think of them as biological replicates. You can maybe more accurately think of them as looking at the spatial heterogeneity at the centimeter scale. Because to a micro, a few centimeters, tens of centimeters, it's a, it's a huge distance. Um, and so we were looking at this metagenome in particular for this, uh, this study. And so what we did was we assembled it, um, we identified the organisms in the sample, um, and prior to binning, we used single, gene, single copy marker genes from um, this data set to look at who was present, just to give us an idea. This would be similar to looking at the 16S ribosomal RNA, except that gene tends to not assemble particularly well in metagenomes. This is actually based on ribosomal protein. We were able to identify the 133 most abundant organisms from that sediment sample at five meters up. What you're looking at is a stacked bar chart. And this is stacked based on phylum, and each box represents a single organism that's scaled to the abundance of that organism in the data set. And so you can see there's chloroplexi, there's snow archaeota, which are the ammonium oxidizing archaea, there's some proteobacteria. We see some candidate phyla, we see 10, this is phyla per. Um, and then I'd also like to point out this novel unknown category, the second most abundant category. Those organisms aren't related to each other. They're just not related to anything in the reference database at this time. Um, and so from this, we targeted the most abundant organisms. They're most abundant. They're potentially most important in geochemistry. We're interested in what those organisms were. So we identified these eight most abundant organisms and then genomes for them. The most abundant organism is its home archaeota. You can see it's hugely abundant compared to all the other organisms in this data set. But when you take all of the metagenomes reads and map them to this genome, it absorbs less than 1%. It's 0.7% of the total data set. And so when we're looking at most abundant, these are not the dominant organisms. There are no dominant organisms in this system. It's very uh, low abundance, very diverse as a community. Are <coughs> these totally proportional to what's present? That is a very good question that's hard to answer. So the question was, are these proportional to what you see in your data set uh, in, in the actual chunk of original dirt? Um, yes, in that, when we look at the other samples at five meter depths, we see a very similar community composition. We'll see strain variation at that scale, but we'll still see it dominated, not dominated, but most abundant with the Palmar We'll see these other representatives. We'll see a very similar 
um, community composition. When you step further away, either up above the water table or 50 meters away at the site, what you see is uh, a very similar community composition, still mostly chloroplexy, proteobacteria, et cetera, but none of the organisms are the same organism. Uh, maybe 5% share identity at a family level. And, so and if, you went to my, if you went to my backyard? Oh, different again. Yeah. Plus, we have to dig down five meters, which would leave you pretty yeah. full. Okay. So, <laughs> we wanted to make a good comparison. Okay. Yeah, this is in Colorado, so we're, okay. what's your global scale like? <laughs> All bets are off. Okay. Um, okay, so this is just a summary of the eight that we have. We've got Tomar, Fiona, um, there's two organisms identified as candidatus here, and we'll get into them in more detail. Yamatomonadides, Chlorplexi, NC10, WW3, and Delta Proteobacteria. NC10 and WW3 uh, are both candidate phyla, um, although the NC10 does have a culture representative time. Hermatomonodides is relatively uh, understudied. It's got one or two representatives. The chloroplexy is better known. Uh, the chloroplexy followed me around in my scientific career, so uh, I wasn't surprised to see them here. Um, so this on a, on a bacterial and archaeal tree, uh, again, ribosomal proteins, gives you a bit of an idea, again, of, of that relationship between the cladobacteria and the Roku bacteria in this column because they're not related to anything else. But they're pretty clearly not really related to each other. Um, they're separated on the tree. You can see all the other phyla groups. And so just to highlight this a little bit more again, we're calling it candidatus uh, because that is the name you give to a not properly taxonomically described isolate. And we are trying to apply that nomenclature through to metagenomic organisms as well to say, we have a genome. We have evidence in the database of all of these other 16X ribosomal RNAs. I lied. This is 16X ribosomal RNA, sorry. Um, We've seen them in other environments. We've seen them in other data sets. We've never had a genome available. Um, same story for the Roku bacteria, roughly related to the Metrospira and the Um Again, there are Roku bacteria-like sequences in the database. We don't have any of these organisms in culture. We've never had a genome present before. Um, so this is sort of the first look into what is the genomic blueprint for these organisms. So what we were interested specifically in was the geochemical cycling that these organisms were conducting. Um, what you're looking at here is a schematic of the nitrogen cycle. Uh, organisms are, again, at the bottom, the same colors, following through. And an arrow indicates that an organism has that function. So again, ammonium oxidation and the Zomarchiota. And this is based on genome predictions. But if the arrow is solid, then these genes were also present in our proteomic data from the site. And so there's evidence that at least this organism is expressing that protein in the environment. Um, if they're dashed, then they're present on the genome, but we didn't see them in the proteomic data. And that may be because they're not expressed. It may be because, again, these organisms are less than 1% of the community. They have many fewer protein sequences than, than DNA. And so there is a sampling issue there. Um, and what was interesting from this was that when we think about nitrogen cycling, we often think about nitrate reducers to take nitrate all the way to um, nitrogen. Uh, and when we're uh, culturing for organisms, we're often looking for the organisms that have that complete pathway. And in the environment, we almost never observe a complete pathway on a genome. What we see are handoff points, where an organism can conduct certain steps, but not others. Uh, and that those metabolites are potentially in that environment, handed off between organisms, to scrape what energy they can from that step, um, and then move on. They haven't necessarily bothered to maintain a complete pathway, um, which we might think of as energetically favorable, but under the shifting conditions in an environment, it's possible that that's just an energetic load they can't support. That's conjecture. We saw a very similar story, if not more pronounced, in sulfur cycling. Again, solid arrows have protein data to back it up. Dashed arrows are just from genomic predictions. Um, and Again, we see this partial pathways, follow dark purple around. Potential sulfur cycling, but none of the final steps. Kind of thing. Um, and then patchy options, where specifically the Roku bacteria for, uh, has a SOX pathway for sulfur oxidation, as well as a sulfate reduction pathway. So we're not exactly clear why it would need that flexibility in the environment, but as a novel candidate phylum, it clearly plays a relatively important role in the sulfur cycle. It isn't permanently incorporated into any environmental models um, or expectations in terms of culture experiments. And so a final vignette from this story, 
Uh, looking at the NC10, this is a, a no longer a candidate phyla. It does have uh, an isolated representative, the thylamirabilis octifera. And this was an interesting organism we discovered, because it was actually hunted down based on building a grid of electron donors and acceptors and saying, energetically, an organism should exist that can do this thing. And then, what environment would we find this organism in? It went, discovered it, absorbed from a group in the Netherlands. It was very elegant, and they identified a nitrite-dependent anaerobic methane oxidizer. And so, what was tricky about this was when they were looking at the genome, it turned out that this um, methane oxidation was taking place using the aerobic pathway in a completely obligately anaerobic environment, uh, anoxic environment, anaerobic organism. And so, one of the big questions was, where is the oxygen coming from to drive this? It turns out it's a dissociation reaction from nitrate um, that forms oxygen internal to the cell, which is utilized in this reaction in an otherwise oxygen-free environment. It's the only way that this is energetically feasible, but it is energetically feasible, and unsurprisingly, there's a microbe that can do it. Um, and so this is very interesting, but excitingly, we have a second genome from the NC10 phylum. And so the question was, okay, does it also have the hallmarks of this activity? When we looked, we could see that from methanol through to carbon dioxide and then fixation between the carbon vents and Bassin cycle to glycolysis, yes. We could see those genes in the genome. But we couldn't find any evidence whatsoever for this reaction or this reaction. This enzyme is actually currently unknown, and so we couldn't look for it. But based on this, I'm not going to bet that it's there. And conversely, we did actually see a nitrate reductase, now to nitrite. And so, this is a phylum. NC10 is a phylum. It's not surprising that they don't all have the same metabolism. You'd expect a lot of variations. It's a big branch on a tree. Um, and you can see that a little bit more clearly here if we're looking at database sequences affiliated with this, phyla, uh, this phylum. You see Candidatus and Phylobarabilis here in group A. These names came from um, Katrina Edwig et al. Ours falls into group D. This is a fair amount of phylogenetic distance within this group. Um, and so again, not surprising that they don't share that characteristic. But it does mean that now a little bit more caution can be exercised. If you identify in a 16S gene library an NC10 organism, you're not immediately make the leap to it having this nitrite-dependent methane oxidation. Um, and the more genomes we have, the more we can flesh out um, this tree. The, the clearer our predictions will be for this, this kind of shared function across groups. Okay, so this work looked at the abundant organisms in the sediment and discovered that they uh, contribute to geochemical cycles in, in interlinked and, and handoff based ways. Um, it's an example of our ability to go into a complex environment and generate draft genomes for organisms that are at less than 1% abundance. None of those organisms were higher than 1% abundance. And it's giving us access to previously unsequenced phyla and expansion of existing phyla. And that very neatly brings me to uh, my next topic on this, uh, my next story. And this is a new view of the tree in life's diversity. And this is just my favorite picture of the tree. Um, and if I'm going to talk about the tree of life and expansion of the tree of life, that these techniques are, are gaining us the ability to really understand microbial diversity from a new perspective, then you have to start with Darwin. So Darwin is not the first person to arrange life into a structure based on similarities. He is the first to ascribe uh, evolution as the driving force behind that, that radiation. Um, and I think scientific prose has maybe fallen a long way from Darwin's time. We don't have sweeping philosophical statements that accompany our figures anymore. I think he's too bad. Um, if I tried to describe a tree with ever-branching, beautiful ramifications, I think reviewers would give me a bit of a laugh. Uh, and so when he first posited this, this idea of a tree of life, this idea of, of radiations of life emerging was highly controversial. It took a long time for this to be accepted. And then it was accepted, it was popularized, we understood that you know, life radiated out from the origin. And then you know, eventually we have humans. This is Darwin himself up here, which I think is nice. Um, but these trees very rarely ever included microbes. Right? We were looking and categorizing the world we could see around us. And that changed when we entered the molecular era. It changed really dramatically with the work by Carl Woese in the 90s and the 80s, looking at 16X ribosomal RNA sequences and realizing that these 
archaebacteria, these organisms that lived in extreme environments, were actually an entire radiation unto themselves. Um, but they deserved as much a piece of the tree of life as the bacteria, as well as the eukarya. So we got this third branch. And then I think in the molecular era, that extends out to the genomic era. Um, and so when you're thinking about the tree of life now, you can be thinking about not just the organisms that we know of, but the ones that we have genome sequencing for. This is a tree of life uh, based on completely sequenced genomes as of 2006. So there's 150 bacteria, about 20 archaea, 20 eukaryotes. And some of you might be saying, S.I. Flora, why are you showing me a tree from 10 years ago? The reason I am is because when I started this project in the summer of 2015, this was the public view of the tree of life from a genomic perspective. Um, and this was part of a frustration that I and Jill Manfield had around perception of the tree of life and understanding of diversity. Because at the same time, the number of genomes in IMG is close to 30,000 for bacteria, it's close to 600 for archaea, but these numbers are very out of date now because this is moving fast. Um, but at the time, this is where it was. And so the other side of it was many groups were identifying these candidate phyla. Many groups were identifying a really weird organism from their environment of choice, generating a genome, and then adding it to a tree that looked a lot like this one. Taking your canonical groups, adding a branch, finding out where that branch is. But you do that 20 times and you don't have a good picture anymore of where all of those 20 branches fit with each other. You do that 700 times and you really lose track of where you are on this tree. And so what we really wanted to do was build a tree of life that was based on lineages with sequenced genomes because I think we're past just the 16S ribosomal RNA now. We can know more about an organism than just that molecule. We can know a lot more about it. We can have its whole genetic blueprint. And we wanted to focus on improving representation of candidate phyla to see where they actually are, to see what that diversity looks like, where are we at at this time. And so we're sampling the IMG database. This is a database hosted by the Joint Genome Institute. It has all of the genomes available on NCBI. But it also has lots of genomes that are available through their sequencing projects. It's a sequencing center, and so it updates to NCBI more slowly, so it tends to be a more complete database. And we took one representative from each named genus, and then from candidate phyla that don't have orders and families and genera and species, and we took uh, all of them and then pruned it down. What do I mean by any of that? So if I'm looking at the JGI database, organized taxonomically, if I'm looking at the deferobacteria, so the phylum and the bacteria, there are seven genomes, and that actually turned out to be one genome per genera. So that's very easy. I take them all. One representative per genus. That does not hold true for some of the more heavily sampled genera. There are 4,500 <coughs> Staphylococcus genomes available. This is a medically relevant organism, thus there have been Know, numerous sequencing projects looking at differences in strains. And these are not um, these are not bad things to have, nor are they not useful. But when looking at a complete tree of life, a complete diversity of life, streamlining that sampling bias uh, made the data set slightly more manageable. And so we took one from this 4,500. For candidate phyla, they're unclassified. We have candidate phyla, the Agarchaea and the Archaea. It has not been described at deeper taxonomic levels. And so looking at this list initially, it was impossible for me to tell whether or not these organisms were identical, whether or not they represented each an independent class, each an independent genus, etc. And so what I would do is I would take them, I would add them to my trees, and then looking at the branch lengths of known taxonomically defined groups, and the branch lengths that I saw in these groups, I would subsample out to get to about the genus level of representation. And so if these these three organisms were identical, I'd keep one kind of thing. And so that was how I went with the uh, published data. I additionally was working with Jill Banfield. She has a large lab that has a lot of metagenomic sequencing and very active binning projects. She also has many collaborators who are doing similar work, had access to those projects. And so we did mine through some of those projects, specifically looking for candidate phyla who would increase our representation. And we added to that another thousand and some odd genomes um, to the data set in order to make sure that we at least weren't going to scoop ourselves like two minutes later. Um, 
And so these came from a diversity of sites. I think the perspective is often, oh, you'll find weird organisms in very weird places. And that doesn't really hold true. We'll find weird organisms that we haven't seen before everywhere because we're better at looking at them. Um, and so some of the sample sites that we use, this is an estuary, White Oak River in Tennessee. This is Yellowstone, that's a boiling spring, your canonical, classic, extreme environment. That's the rifle site, another view of the rifle site. We also had two dolphin mouth samples um, as part of a project looking at the oral microbiome of different animals. That's a marine. Turns out if you have a collaboration with the marines, they'll sample dolphins for you. Um, this is the attack in the desert. So it's a, a very arid, high salt environment. This is the crystal geyser in Utah. Um, it's a high CO2 environment. It erupts very periodically. And so you can have a very set schedule. Uh, this is the geyser itself. It's got all of these little driblets coming up the side because those are bullet holes, because it's in Utah. <laughs> Stick up out of the ground, Utah. <laughs> Someone will shoot at you. <laughs> Uh, this is a meadow in San Francisco, and this is a, a location in Japan where they store nuclear waste. It's 300 meters below ground. So there's this deep, deep uh, terrestrial surface, and they have boreholes to the sides that we were able to sample. So some of that is work with Banfield Lab, some of that is collaborators with Banfield Lab who allowed us access to their data sets. You can see, like, an estuary, a meadow, these are not extreme environments, boiling spring, a high CO2 geyser. Slightly more extreme. But you see organisms from lineages that we don't have in culture from all of these environments. Okay, so our final data set ended up being a little over 3,000 organisms, again at you know single representative per genus. Um, and we had data sets of 16 ribosomal proteins, these are single copy uh, genetic markers that are present on a single um, co encoded space in a genome. And so even if your genome is fragmented, they will be on a single piece, which is useful for preventing having any chimeras, chimeric sequences. <laughs> we had 16S ribosomal RNA genes, and we ran this tree on the Cypress supercomputer. And that's when, like, ta da, that's what we did. You, you write up in a paper, but what we actually did was run it on a number of different supercomputers with various clusters that had various limitations, and this tree died on all of them for exceeding time availability for a job, for exceeding memory for exceeding amount of swaps, I don't know, pick, pick a user error and you'll get it. Um, and I was getting pretty frustrated in my inability to run this when I discovered the Cypress supercomputer, which if you are doing any phylogenetic work whatsoever, is such a fantastic resource because they have taken the time to install all of these programs as parallelized as possible. And so when you're running RaxML and you're not stuck with one thread that will run out of memory, you're across 40 cores kind of thing. And uh, it's free for academic users. If you're in Canada, you get 10,000 user hours per year for free based on your account. Your account is based solely on an email. Most of us have one email. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, it's also pretty hard to use 10,000 computer hours running trees, uh, but you can. Um, and so that is how we actually ran the tree. We used Raxamo, um, these maximum likelihood, relatively robust uh, algorithm. And this is the tree. So this is actually based on the um, 16 ribosomal proteins data set, in part because it was more complete. Because again, from our metagenomes, the 16S ribosomal RNA is often lost. And so we have a larger, more complete data set if we look from the protein side. And there are a number of things to take away from this. I've marked all of the lineages that are candidate phyla with a red dot. And you can see that they're scattered throughout the bacteria. They're very heavily uh, a part of the archaeal diversity. Then there's a huge radiation called the candidate phyla radiation in the bacteria that's composed entirely of organisms uh, for which we don't have a cultured representative. Um, and when we're looking at this tree, we were really struck by the weight of the evolutionary diversity within the bacteria. And again, we sampled on a universal level, you know, one per genera. There are fewer eukaryotic genomes because eukaryotic genomes are much larger, harder to sequence. And so that may be sampling bias, but the eukaryotes have had a lot less evolutionary time to diverge, and so it also would not be surprising if their total global diversity was lower than that of the archaea or bacteria. We're not sure why we have less diversity in the archaea, because metagenomic sampling, at least, would not be selecting between these two. It's our archaea present, the diversity of archaea is present, it should be sampled. And that was a surprise for us. 
Um, and again, you see isolated representatives scattered throughout the tree. And on this tree only, the eukaryotes do place within the archaea, branching out from the archaea of the Loki archaeota and the Thor archaeota as the closest groups. Um, the Loki archaeota were recently described as having some of the most eukaryotic like features in terms of their um, cytoskeletal features and their signaling pathways. So they look like a potential stepping stone to a eukaryotic cell. This is very early work, but it's interesting that they're grouping together on this tree. The Thor archaeota, the Loki and Thor, this could be Norse mythology, but the paper on the Thor archaeota is calling it the Asgardian plane. So Marvel is winning this one. Um, the Avengers. Uh, but what I want to really emphasize, because we didn't, like, uh, on a, a statistical level, we have no support for this relationship. We carry it specifically within the archaea. And looking at the 16S ribosomal RNA, we see your canonical three domain tree. Bacteria, the archaea, the eukaryotic branching. Um, and this is uh, interesting. I think this is one of the big questions moving forward. It's been a big question in biology for a long time. Where did the eukaryote itself come from? What are its origins? What is its diversity? And I think the only way to answer this with any kind of confidence is to increase our sampling. And that's exactly what we're doing. And so we thought it was time for a new view. We were surprised even by how interesting a view it was. Uh, I gave this talk, or a similar talk, in uh, February at a Gordon Research Conference. And at the beginning of the talk, the Wikipedia page looked the way it was when I showed you. And by the end of the talk, <laughs> the Wikipedia page <laughs> looked like this. And I love this. Um, but what I'm most excited about this is that this tree is already out of date. It was out of date before the paper came out because there had been a new archaeal lineage described that wasn't on the tree. It is even more out of date now, seven months later. Um, and, and I'm so excited that that's the space that we're in. And we're going to need you know, consistent updates on this. But our ability to examine microbial diversity has, has never been as strong. And I think that's a really interesting place to be. Okay. I have a couple minutes, so if you'll indulge me, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm doing in my group at the University of Waterloo. I started in January. Um, and I have been spending a lot of time thinking about garbage. And I don't think most other people do. I think you take your garbage out, you take it to the chute, you take it to the curb, it disappears. As long as you don't get stuck on your bike behind a garbage truck, you don't really think about it from that point onwards. Or if you do, you think about garbage as sort of a hazy pile, landfill of garbage, bulldozer maybe, that kind of thing. Um, but in reality, landfills are actually highly engineered environments. And they're environments that are embedded in natural systems. And they are built to prevent leaks into those systems, into groundwater, into aquifers. And what you see are ways of trapping the gas and the groundwater that are present in these sites um, to prevent them from impacting the sites around them. And uh, landfills make a lot of liquid. They make a lot of leachate. They make a lot of gas. Most of it's methane, uh, which is greenhouse gas. And so that's a problem environmentally. They can be venting methane. They're about 20% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions comes from landfill methane. Newer landfills trap that methane, convert it to biogas, run their site, and then feed power to the grid. And so they are pro-methane emissions. They're utilizing it. They're not uh, an environmental hazard. And that hazy idea, like kind of a giant pile of garbage, doesn't really work that well. So this is an aerial view of the region of Waterloo landfill. Uh, this is the landfill itself, right here. Uh, and this is the active zone. Yeah, that's the active zone where they're adding garbage. The rest of it looks like a giant park. It's a reclaimed hill, that kind of thing. And this is, site is heavily instrumented. There are about 300 uh, groundwater wells outside the site on the perimeter, checking for leaks, watching for environmental impact. There are about 40 within the site itself where leachate can be sampled. And they have geochemical data dating back about 15 years for many of those sites. And so for me, it's a really interesting site to be working with. So landfills are considered in the global top 10 the polluted sites. They're growing rapidly in North America as well as in the developing world. They're managed better in, in North America than in the developing world, but they represent sort of still significant sources of methane, highly heterogeneous contaminated sites. They tend to have high ammonia levels, uh, they tend, but they're also a global reservoir of metals. And so um, when you, uh, in developing worlds where the landfill is not as cleanly capped and kept pretty and you know, encouraged for regrowth. Um, what you have is people making a living mining copper out of landfills. 
by walking around on that pile of garbage and looking for copper and other metals. But as we deplete our global reserves of copper, our landfills are going to start to become sources rather than sinks, potentially. And if you think about it as a big methane-producing bubble, it's not something you necessarily want to dig into. Um, and so for me, a landfill is a perfect spot to look for unknown organisms and to look for functions that are related to bioremediation. There are a lot of functions that we've seen in landfills. Um, we don't know what organisms conducting them. We don't know the molecular mechanism. And those are the kinds of things that my lab is going after. We spent the summer, I had an army of undergraduate volunteers, um, and we went sampling leachate and groundwater wells around the site. I tried as they might, I could not find a single picture where someone is standing up. And so this is not very strenuous field work, I guess. Um, we're looking at microbial function, diversity, heterogeneity. We're using omics, we're using culture-based methods. And uh, we're interested in what the, the remediation potential is at the site, the functional potential is for things like bioplastics that are an emerging waste stream. Um, and looking for new remediation options for other sites. So that's sorts of things that we're looking at. Um, and in general, that's where we're headed, which I'm excited about. Maybe add some new branches to the tree, but in general, I'm more interested on the functional side, so we're going to be exploring that. Um, so there were a lot of people involved in this work. Uh, I have to highlight Jill. Uh, we worked very closely together on that Tree of Life paper. It was uh, a lot of her impetus spurring that project forward. Um, other members of the Banfield uh, lab, people involved in the candidate file story, collaborators involved in the tree of life story, and then so forth. A couple minutes for questions, but then I think we have a chance to chat. So. Hey, Lord. Uh, nice to talk. Uh, so, going back to one of your first data slides, okay. you showed the stack plots of the different phyla. Talk about organisms, organisms, organisms for each one of those segments within that stack plot. So I didn't know exactly what you meant by organism, and I wonder how, you know, how firm are those lines between these organisms? Do you see signals of polymorphism, or right. do you see signals of horizontal transfer? So I don't in my data, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Um, these would be better described as populations, absolutely. And, and genomes from metagenomics are population genomes. Um, we don't. We didn't start with a single isolate. Has it been a constrained amount of time for no evolution to take place? Um, and so, yes, they should be populations. I don't, it, like, it is hard to know at what level the assembler will combine reads um, at a certain level of divergence. We know that at about 96, they start to split percent. And so, this is probably merging strains. We take 97 as a species barrier, and about that, it's strain differentiation. Um, there are ways of mapping the reads back and looking at those polymorphisms. We absolutely see polymorphisms in the population, and that varies a lot. So actually, the per genome here, Canada phyla uh, per genome, I think had two polymorphisms in a genome of about a million base pairs, which was cleaner than some isolates kind of thing. Whereas the Pilmarchiota, a mimosabendent organism, is pretty messy. Like that, that looks like three or four different strains merged together. Similar enough to assemble and to assemble with confidence, um, but uh, definitely representing uh, a population. And so you do see abundant shifts in the scaffolds in terms of insertions or deletions that are in some populations and not others. That can confound binning. Um, and so when piecing a genome together, we're pretty careful to make sure that there's a consistent signal across. Um, so we do look at the read mapping. There was a program that did this really well for Sanger sequencing called Strainer that would let you actually look at polymorphisms and do some calculations. We're trying to revive it to look at Illumina data, and now they're going to need long read too, right? <laughs> the technology keeps moving. Um, but we haven't quite gotten to that. Uh, they don't have that yet. And so most of this is me manually looking at the read maps of my scaffolds across. So, but yes, population is good. So, at a certain level, you're Basically, it's a population that has a bunch of different organisms that actually work together to get pathways sort of going from one organism to or, or uh, outcome of one step of an antibiotic pathway is precursor to the next step. And so, in a way, you don't really need to know which what's in the bag of the bacteria. In the sense that you're looking at bags of multiple bacteria. Right. Yes, and so you can. And so, so, the, so my question: yeah. Do you need the intellectual satisfaction of closing your 
<laughs> or is, is that necessary? Well, none of my eight were closed. So on a personal level, that's my answer. <laughs> but and then and down to the end of or twenty. And yeah. so the long reads of long reads sort of make you happier? No, not necessarily. So there's there's a couple of points here that I'm gonna touch on. Um, so when I'm talking about a population that's different from the community, just the terminology, sure. right? So yeah. a population would mean sort of one group of these, the community would be this little thing. Yeah. So yeah, in a community, you do see the um, these handout points. Yeah. And if I just took my scaffolds and didn't bin them at all, and looked sort of from a global overview, I'd see, oh, I have total nitrate re reduction, right? Yeah. I have that complete pathway. It's yeah. absolutely here. That can take place in my environment. I would not realize that there wasn't one organism conducting that function, right? That it was pieced across a number of different organisms. Um, which I think, when you're thinking about modeling these systems, when you're thinking about attempting to culture these organisms, is an important aspect. Knowing what's in that bag of that population of cells, that, that organism, um, then you can try to target your isolation of uh, attempts based on what you think its predictive functions are. No good to give it halfway down the pathway if it's only up at the front. Um, in terms of closing a genome to satisfaction, it's hard to give a talk on metagenomics and not have a question pop up about, do you believe your genomes? Do you think you've just created Frankenstein hybrids? Are these chimeras? And to which I'm saying, like, they are to some extent populations. I put a lot of time into these genomes to make sure that they're clean. Uh, that they don't have pieces of other organisms, possibly to the extent of losing some of those pieces because they were maybe recently acquired and they don't have the right signature. Um, and I look at, I look at all of the assemblies, I look at the reads, and so I know that these are good pieces. They look, you know, I would accept that from an isolate genome, I accept it from my genome. Um, if you can close the genome, those questions evaporate. Um, and so, from an acceptance point of view, I think it's important. From a biology point of view, I can talk about absence in the pathway if the genome is closed. I can only talk about the potential absence of a pathway compared to missing data if it's not closed. Even if I'm at 99% of a predicted genome completion, I have it in two pieces, maybe those two pieces are acetate fermentation, right? And I can't say that the genome doesn't have it. And so, in order to, to fully describe a genome, yes. If I want just the global umbrella that's taking place at a site, none of that's necessary. And that's a completely valid way of looking at this data. Did you come across phage? Yes. Tons of phage. Yeah. It's tricky. So the sediment data tends to have more, in part because when we filter groundwater, phage particles that aren't associated to a host will just go through. We're not collecting them on a, on a filter. Um, but they some, some will. You see some prophage. You see some ancient prophage that are you know, predicted to not be very um, viable at this point. Yeah. Um, so you do see prophage, but you also see very, very high abundance scaffolds with phage characteristics, with phage genomes, um, that we assume are actually just actively infecting hosts and replicating at that time. So they're actually typically at very high uh, abundance. There's been moderate success connecting CRISPR loci on genomes to phage in data sets. Um, there was a beautiful paper by a group in Ohio, excuse me, that came out uh, two months ago, I think. Um, and they they were looking at fracking fluid. It's a much simpler system. They were able to tie a, a huge proportion of their viral genomes to CRISPR and, and, and connect the hosts. In our system, um, another postdoc was working on phage. I think they had, it was 1,200 phage genomes. We have a database of about 2,000 microbial genomes from the same site and they could map two of them. Um, and so, sort of hints at the other diversity, right? The rest of the diversity out there. Yeah. So, what about the last question about the, you need a bag of bacteria to carry out all the entire, like, denitrification process, for example. So, would you be able to enrich some of those processes if you go to different depth of the soil or different depth of the... Probably. I and mean, I think that you'd see that shift with the geochemistry at the site. Um, I haven't looked at it at this site specifically, um, but I would I would hope, right? That's the hope of the modelers. We were working with a group of modelers who were looking at a GWASC for the system to connect fluid flow dynamics as well as the trait-based modeling. And every time we came up with data, they were really unhappy with us because we were making it really more complex than they wanted. Um, but the idea was that you'd be able to tie those geochemical systems uh, conditions 
to the microbial populations, or at least the functional side of the microbial system. Um, and uh, that work's not done yet, so I'm not exactly sure. I will not be surprised if it's not that clean uh, a connection. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all of the questions we have time for. Uh, there's a pizza session now in the black group, so if you guys want to ask her. Yeah.